place to hide. No place to run. No place to run. The mutant age, the mutant age has now begun. It's been, it's been, it's Okay, it is with heavy heart that we present to you the final episode for now, because Wolverine 3 is coming and we will be back uh, of Mike and Matt's excellent adventures. Uh, Throughout this whole journey, I have been Matt Waters and I have always been joined by Mike Thomas, but he's not here this time. You're just going to hear me talk for a very, very long time about Wolverine and the X-Men. So here, oh, no, sorry, Mike is it. Mike, you are here, right? Yeah, it was, it was that it was my idea for us to rewatch this entire show before doing this, and um, as punishment, you have scolded me multiple times online for being anything but positive about it. So I guess that was deserved. That's true. That's true. If you just gone with my sort of memory of it versus you know I've watched all of this over the course of a while, um, you would have had an easier fight. But now. I'm, I'm energized. I, I've seen it all. I'm reminded. I've noticed things. I've made observations. So bring your best, because uh, I think extremely highly of this show, and you think just quite highly of it. I think. Yeah, it's it's like what the. Uh, I feel like there is a. It's like me with first class versus you with first class. Yeah, that, that sounds about right. Yeah, <laughs> or like me with X two and you with X two. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, just to get this rolling, um, I, this is my favorite adaptation of the X-Men across any medium outside of comic books. Okay, respond. Um, I think it's by far the most ambitious. I think it's by far made by the biggest fans of X-Men. Like, I watch this and think, like, this felt like the people making the show felt like kids in a candy store being like, what, what can we do? Like, it felt like they said, why not, to basically every single scenario. And it is so meticulously plotted. Um, Like, I mean, it's a, well, not completely serialized, it is a very serialized show. Um, And they kind of seamlessly weave together, like, 50 different plots into season one, do a bold reimagination of Days of Future Past, uh, incorporate the phoenix but not so that it overwhelms the show they managed to cherry pick basically the best characters out of the show they find a creative way to remove charles xavier while including him i and they perfectly set up the next conflict in the never happening season two i mean it was incredibly impressive to watch this i don't think there's another cartoon like this uh, I think it, I think it blows away the animated series. I think it blows away evolution, and I think I would have to rewatch Batman the animated series a ton to and see a a lot of greatness happen there uh, for me to th- think this is not better. But uh, this is my favorite cartoon uh, adaptation of a comic property for sure, and it's so tough. I think because I mean. It's a, it's a total what-if scenario. I don't think this is better than the first two X-Men movies, but because I don't think we can separate those two from the rest of the X-Men, or at the very least we can't separate it from The Last Stand, I think you might be right then. Uh, I'd probably, you know, I guess if we... You said outside of comics, so I guess... Um, I mean, my favorite adaptation is Whedon's Astonishing X-Men run. That's my favorite... Or not adaptation. That's my favorite... Version probably, of X-Men. X-Men thing, probably. But... I think with a little tweaking, this would be better. And honestly, it, it's pretty close as it is. Like, yeah. and, and I, I could wake up tomorrow and say, you know what, this is better. It has a more well-rounded team and pulls from more sources, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, think, I think this also proves that uh, a cartoon TV show is possibly the best way for comic book properties to be adapted because there's always going to be a finite number of episodes because cartoons are time consuming to produce but they don't have the restrictions of getting talented actor like on screen actors who you know have a limited shelf life of how long they're willing to commit to the series and honestly constantly through watching this I kept like 
doing my own mental fan fiction of how I would want to do a version of X Men the cartoon, and and uh, so I think that that always I always think that speaks highly of something if it makes me want if it makes me feel creative. Um, but yeah, so this is a um, very cool experience that any X Men fan should check out for sure. Yeah, um, a lot covered there, but uh, I I agree with all of those sentiments. It was the process of making my notes for this episode that and sort of trying to identify like okay what are the major plot lines here uh what's going on here with this character that character how does this all weave together that made me realize this is a really impressive feat of of planning of writing of execution uh narratively across the whole season um it it flew too close to the sun um and you, you say that it feels like it's it's made by like big fanboys and I think one of the strengths for me personally is the creative team because uh to... and that was an insult by the way when I said that I meant that as like a compliment. No, absolutely. Yeah, I agree with you. Um I I I feel the same way and the three biggest names really behind this show uh well for for me the people that stand out uh it's created by Craig Kyle and Greg Johnson. Uh, but the the team specifically of Craig Carl and Chris Yost, um, they've written a bunch of cartoons for Marvel, including some episodes of Evolution. Uh, they went on to write Avengers Earth's Mightiest Heroes together, which is actually a pretty good Marvel cartoon as well. Uh, but they also, you know, they're writing films. Uh, I think they are writers on, or at least one of them is, uh, on Thor Ragnarok, but for me, the big thing is they created X-23, who was my favorite X-Men character, and they were then creatively behind uh, the third incarnation of X-Force, which is uh, that you can create like a run in the comics from uh, Messiah Complex through X-Force and through a certain line of X-Men comics that is my favorite line, uh, my favorite run of X-Men comics. So like, these two dudes, Craig Carl and Chris Yost, for me, when I see their names attached to projects, I'm immediately down. And it makes all the sense in the world that they would be the guys that made this show. And when we were talking about X-Men Evolution before, I, I made a comment about how it's a very fitting title because you can see how they got from the original animated series to this. And a lot of the people involved with Evolution ended up on Wolverine and the X-Men. And you can really see sort of how they took what they had before and turned it into a a more refined, mature, better version of what they had. And uh, I think... Well, it... I'm kind of like taking ideas and concepts there so that if you were a kid and you watched that, so many things would seem so seamless. Just like who is in the Brotherhood would make perfect sense if you had watched X-Men Evolution as a kid. Because it's like, it's literally the exact same five doofuses. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then Domino. But uh, I don't know. It was just... It's so impressive. Yeah, it it feels like a perfect marriage of there are elements of the films, there are elements obviously of the comics, there are elements of evolution and the old animated series. I think it blends those three worlds together. Uh, the looks are very Joss Whedon's Astonishing X Men, or for, for some of the characters anyway. Um, it it looks a bit like X Men Evolution, but uh, you know, uh, a better version of it. Um, yeah. It just yeah, it, it's got an incredible. I really love the look of it, like almost every single character uh, when they appear on screen. I my heart lights up. Uh, Scarlet Witch in particular. I really can't explain why her in particular, but that character design I think is is perfect because uh, it doesn't look like too goofy, but it also is true to the original design. I don't know, but uh, everyone's voiced well, pretty much. Uh, like even if you take away all the the impressive things about it, if it was just like here's a cartoon. It looks great and it sounds great, so that's an immediate win. And then when you look at what they did narratively, where they are mixing and mashing all these different uh, iconic stories, like there are elements of Days of Future Past, there's the Phoenix, there's uh, the Shadow King, all this stuff, like Mr. Sinister, even Apocalypse shows up. They they marry all of this stuff together into one cohesive plot line of their own, and I think it's very impressive that they managed to do that. And you said how it's serialized. I think by having so many, uh, having a multitude of plot lines going on all at once and they sort of tap into one for a couple of episodes and then they'll, they'll leave it for a while and come back to it. I think it was a tremendous help in not getting like 
too weighed down or anything because like say you don't like the whole brotherhood story or, or genosha it's fine because here's some other stuff going on in the future or with the mrd or here's gambit you know like they they introduce new things or they they put things to the back as as needed and for me personally i mean some people might not have liked this but i i, I thought that was a real strength that it did manage to elegantly juggle like 10 different plot lines at once yeah, I, I definitely think they pretty much elegant, uh, elegantly did it. Um, I think the difference between you and me is that I was not as into a lot of them as you were, but it was impressive how they did nonetheless. Uh, an interesting, really, I think an interesting exercise to do though is to go to the IMDb page for it and then check the full cast to see how spread out all the characters are. Yeah. I mean, Wolverine is in all twenty six episodes, obviously, because it's called Wolverine and the X Men. Uh. But after that. Like everyone is in like some range of like five to fifteen or something like basically. I mean, like to me, I remember watching the show and thinking Bishop was such a big part of the show, and now I'm looking at it now and he's literally in six episodes. Yeah. And um, and that's just because it felt like I mean the fact that Forge is only in ten episodes blows my mind. Uh, but uh, this was it's just impressive. Yeah, it's just impressive. Um, I guess. We should get into... Oh, actually, did you write a plot summary? Uh, yeah, I've kind of got, like, a uh, the plot of the whole general series, and then yeah. I've also identified the big arcs, if we wanted to tackle it in terms of, like, one arc at a time, or I've also got it just in terms of what is good and what is bad. It's really your call here, bud. I have all the notes in the world. <laughs> um, well, let's, like, go over what is the main driving force of the show. Okay. Like what is going on in this world? This okay. version of the world. So basically, the the show begins with Wolverine is about to leave the X Men. Uh, he's having an argument with Cyclops. Jean is angry at Cyclops and siding with Wolverine. In the first of our many, uh, Wolverine is the grand hero. Everyone loves him. Issues, uh, but there is a huge explosion at the mansion, and then it cuts to a year later. The X Men are not a thing anymore. Xavier is missing. Jean Grey is missing. And Wolverine is working solo against uh, the MRD, who are your basic government snatch the mutant people. Uh, and Wolverine just decides, okay, we need to get the team back together. And so you have him gradually rebuilding this team. And some of them are a bit skeptical because they're like, well, Wolverine's not really a natural leader. Like, does it work without Xavier? Does it work without Cyclops? Um, they find Xavier's body and they start receiving communications from him 20 years in the future where it's a kind of Days of Future Past style hellscape where sentinels rule everything and everyone's rounded up into camps and whatnot. And he's basically trying to uh, mentor Logan into being a good leader so that he can recruit more X-Men and get this team together and also send them to trouble areas before bad things can happen. They're trying to prevent that future from taking place and, and he changes his mind about what he thinks causes it a couple of times over the show. But it's basically a, hey guys, this is going to be an issue, go there and go there and whatnot. And uh, they add more members and you've got so much going on with uh, Xavier in the future. You've got the Brotherhood, you've got uh, the government and Senator Kelly, uh, you've got Magneto on his own island of Genosha, Mr. Sinister's involved, a lot goes down. Uh, and it ultimately boils down to sort of figuring out what happened to Gene, what caused this explosion, can they prevent this future from taking place? Yeah, and um, I think, I don't want to start off on a negative point. I do think we need to address the fact that Wolverine is the center of the show. Yes. Not just in, you know, mechanically, like he's the only character in every episode. He's the main character of the majority of the episodes. But he's also... This is very much like X Men: The Last Stand mm. uh, art for Wolverine, in that the team is in tr- is in shambles, and he must pull them all together. I think that is possibly the worst arc possible for Wolverine. Uh, I just don't think it fits him, even if it's a natural, as we talked about, a natural place for his character to go. Like it's hard for that character. If he's just like if he's just going to be complete, it's like Magneto. It's like if you don't commit eventually, like it just feels repetitive. But for that to be the driving force of the show, I find to be quite a cynical storytelling 
choice. Yeah, I, it's an unavoidable thing to... The, the show is called Wolverine and the X-Men. Like, front and centre, here's Wolverine, huge, huge letters, and the X-Men. You know, like, obviously, at this at the time this was made, you know, Wolverine is very much in vogue. They Fox are very much aware that he is the most popular character. He's got his own film. He's the star of everything. So they leaned into the popularity. And you do get some, some truly gross stuff, like when we see the flashback of why Wolverine left, uh, him hitting on Jean is as egregious as, as it ever was in any of the films. Like, he's full-on creeping outside her, her room and, like, sleezing all over her. Um, and then she blows him a kiss before the world explodes. Uh, yeah, she blows him this kiss and it, it's the worst. Um, and, like, yeah, the, the, the notion that Wolverine is the grand saviour of everything and they all fall apart without him that is extremely problematic and it doesn't help that in my opinion i think the worst episodes of this show are the ones where wolverine goes off by himself uh yes. with, with hulk with weapon x with the silver yes. samurai but yep. at least the silver samurai one was more interesting than the wolverine if only because it was an hour and a bit shorter um so that is all very much a problem I will say in their defense, it's one of the more plausible versions of Wolverine as the Grand Savior because, um, I mean, we've talked we've talked about how the plan for uh, Brian Singer's plan for X Men Three was Cyclops is is broken by losing Jean and he's sort of, you know, he goes to extremes, and I think that you know they sort of use an element of that here where Cyclops is so bent out of shape about Gene, that he's too much of a wreck to really step up. They are without Xavier, everything is scattered, and Wolverine has, you know, he's in the thick of it still. And because Cyclops is, you know, how he is, and Wolverine in this instance is more assertive, it is a more plausible way of having him step up. But then you do have the heavy handedness of Xavier being all like, oh, only you can lead them. Uh, yeah. And they, they do give it the token, like, oh, Scott, it's good to see you here as well, and trying to make them a bit of a team at some points, but the sort of brushing everyone aside for Wolverine does, it, you know, it sweeps the legs out from under the argument I was just trying to make. Yeah. I, but you do bring up a good point, though, is that this is probably the closest we'll ever come as a follow-up to X2. In the broad that. strokes, this is basically what Brian Singer was going for, was that Cyclops was going to be a dick, probably a bit more ruckusly militant. Wolverine was going to have to keep everything together. The, what are they? Um, you can do it. What's uh, Sebastian Shaw's group called? Oh, well, they're the Hellfire, Hellfire Club, Club Hellfire but Hellfire they Club. didn't want to say hell on TV, so they just called them the Inner Circle, I guess. Oh, I didn't know that. That's dumb. Um, well, that, that's my guess, because they never oh, okay. say Hellfire Club. They always call them the Inner Circle, and my guess is they couldn't say hell. That's probably right, because it was a Saturday morning cartoon. Mm-hmm. Um, Doesn't feel like the, one sometimes. Though. The Hellfire Club's angling for something with Gene. Magneto's angling for something with Gene. So it's basically, you know, that was basically the plot of what Brian Singer had imagined for X3. Yeah. So This is the true conclusion to the Singer trilogy. Uh, I mean, not quite, but I'm saying, <laughs> if you want... I, it's definitely a better use of your time to watch 26, 20-minute episodes of this than to watch The Last Stand. That's true. And it kind um, of would work. Like <laughs> You just have yeah, to I mean, change a couple of small details and it does fit. Yeah. Um, I didn't think of it that until the way you just des- um, described it. All right, um, so yeah, that's a problem. And that's kind of a problem they can't escape. Because... I mean, you can't call the show but, Wolverine the X-Men. Of the, we talked about how we had different memories of the show. And yeah. I think actually my memory of the show was probably a bit higher than yours. And the way I remembered it was that, okay, yeah, they called it Wolverine and the X-Men, but really it was just an X-Men show, and they were kind of capitalizing on Wolverine's popularity by making him the leader. And I watched it this time and felt like, God, episode after episode feels like it's somehow they've shoehorned Wolverine into it. Um, you know, like even the, uh, although actually it was probably the first use of mojo that i've ever liked the second mojo episode wolverine <laughs> is the you know zombie mutant and i'm just like god even in this episode where he's not even a character he has to be a part of it <laughs> and uh i think like i said just that decision to make it wolverine the x-men 
like that the title of the driving force of the show just kind of weak and given that it didn't even get a second season in the, first, in the place it kind of like wasn't worth it but yeah. uh you know who knows maybe the show doesn't get made without that well that was going to be my suggestion that maybe the only way they could get this cartoon green lit was wolverine has to be front and center we'd like you to call it wolverine you know maybe it was like oh we want you to do a wolverine cartoon and they were countered with well what if we did like wolverine and the x-men uh, i we who knows we're not in the the boardroom at whoever made this cartoon um i was yeah, i don't know watched, uh, hulk versus the wolverine yeah i have it i think yeah. we could have done uh from the same dudes <laughs> um yeah um i it at times it is incredibly grating um as I said, I think the solo episodes are basically the weakest ones. But, I don't know, I think there's enough going on all at once that it, yes. it doesn't, feel, it doesn't Like, I just said all like. that after waxing poetically about it for, like, a half hour straight to open the show. So, I mean, <laughs> it's like, it's this weird thing where it's a huge problem at the same time you can forgive it at almost every moment. Yeah. Except for the truly, truly Wolverine-centered where there's no other X-Men around episodes. Yeah. I will like, say... Yeah. Samurai. those terrible episodes um or the less good ones they at least in a couple of them they do actually put in some important stuff for the overall story i mean even if even if that doesn't save the episode it does at least you can see why it's there within the whole canon like uh the episode with with Wolverine having the flashback with Maverick and his daughter and whatnot, that's the episode where you find out Quicksilver is actually fully in cahoots with Magneto after it seems like he's gone, you know, off on his own. Uh, that's the episode where Rogue is starting to doubt her decision to join the Brotherhood. Um, you have, in the Weapon X episode, you have some big reveal with Mystique and Wolverine having a romantic past, and you have... A tease of X twenty three, Matt's favorite, uh, who does appear later. Uh, I can't really defend the Silver Samurai episode though. There's nothing important there. You can skip that one all day long. Yeah. All right. Um, I guess we can like take a look at the X Men team and how they use them a little bit. So there's Wolverine. Yeah. Early on, it seems like Beast is going to be a big character. Like he's the first person back with the team, and and then he kind of I kind of didn't even. Without even realizing it, he just kind of slowly becomes a non-entity in the show. Yeah, I, I'm Which struggling really to remember him past... I mean, I remember him coming into the library while Kitty and Iceman are there, but other than that, I really don't remember yeah. him past that first episode. He didn't really do a lot in the show. I mean, I think he's always one of those characters that's going to be invaluable, so you should always have him around, but um, there basically was no arc for him. Mm. Uh, I really like the addition of Forge. I thought that was great comic relief also like just a, for a practical standpoint a great explanation of how quickly they're able to you know get all these mechanical resources to support them yeah i like um, i like wolverine scratching the jet after he just had it perfectly yeah. done <laughs> something about it kind of remind me of the dynamic with morph in the animated series so i don't know i guess i've always been biased towards that because morph you yeah know, more i don't know Wolverine and a younger, wackier character is, is yeah, generally pretty there, fun. There's just something about the morph dynamic with Wolverine that I really appreciated as a kid, and um, so I'm well, biased. Well, that. that's that's the problem. Like Wolverine, you know, he's undoubtedly cool, but when you lean so fully into how serious and like joyless he is, you're wasting it. Like it, what if yeah. you have him that way? You need people to play off him because then it becomes funny instead of just. And like they do it with Batman sometimes. They don't, yeah. Anyway, yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, Shadow Cat, Kitty Pride's there. She's great. I think uh, this. They really like this. Kind of remind me of Weed's run with Kitty, and yeah. I really, really love. Like Weed loves Kitty Pride, obviously. Oh yes. <laughs> and um, this felt very similar to that, and uh, worked for me. I think she's. I think her power is awesome. I think it leads to a lot of creativity. Yeah. And um, that was good. Um, War Angel Warren Worthington was there. It seemed once because he's like in a lot of the image, like a lot of the advertising for the show, like in terms of posters and such. So you kind of think he's going to be a big part of it. And then I'm actually going to look up his episode count right now because it feels like he's barely in the show. I'm going to guess seven. No, no it's, it's going to be more than that. Um, but t- uh, ten. Um, 
and they really, really rush his art. It's it's kind of amazing. <laughs> well, I mean, he's um, like he bankrolls them going from a ruined mansion to where the X Men again. So he is important in that way. Like he gives them the money to get back on their feet. Yeah, and and um, but there's basically <laughs> late in the show. Uh, he finally makes the decision to. He's in. Oh, you called it. He's in seven episodes. Um, late in the show, he decides he's going to be a part of it because he thinks, like, you know, it's really getting apocalyptic enough for him to be involved and risk exposing himself to his father, who is also, like, secretly funding all these anti mutant stuff. And then one episode later, after it's revealed he's him, he's just full on mutant, like, vigilante. And then he gets turned into Archangel by the end of the episode. It just <laughs> felt very forced, and uh, I don't know. I think I, I think I think I sent like three, three dozen like complaining DMs to you as soon as I, as soon as I saw it. So I was like, what just happened here? Yeah, uh, that was. I thought that was a little silly, but you know, not the end of the world. Just less than ideal. Yeah, um, but maybe you I, have to trim a a plot line to do more angel stuff and i'm not sure yeah. i would give up i mean i would give up the solo wolverine stuff but i would imagine that was a mandate so yeah i think like when i watched this show i felt a lot more like god i kind of feel like they need a game of thrones approach where they just kind of slowly move along all the plots in each episode mm. as opposed to being like let's devote a whole episode to wolverine and gambit on an adventure but that can be quite annoying as well because you, be. you never quite get what you want <laughs> i know um, which is why people endlessly complain about Game of Thrones. Yeah, seems. and you can look forward to us discussing all of Game of Thrones uh, two oh, years from now. <laughs> yeah. Um, what well, yeah. That'll be quite the project. Yes. Um, Nightcrawler's in it. He seems a bit mopey in this, right? Well, I yeah, I, I figure they, like I said, I think they're drawing from those first three films i think they're drawing from joss whedon and i think they're drawing yeah. from the cartoons and you know tortured night tortured but still kind of fun nightcrawler is because i never really thought of him as that tortured until uh x2 where you yeah. get this far more like existential like sad version and, and that was great but i don't we don't need that to be every time exactly yeah so i think I think they like pull an element of it, and he's also the storyline he's in is an inherently quite sad one, but they yeah. do keep him still a little bit upbeat, you know, like he's sword fighting and he's you know having fun. Yeah, um, Iceman's in it, but barely. There's a weird timeline issue with him where <laughs> they very clearly say he's 18 when they tell his parents you have to let him be an X Men again. Um, and then we see flashbacks later on where yeah. he's with the original X-Men team of Beast, Angel, Cyclops, Iceman, and and Gene. Yeah. So that doesn't really add up unless he's like 12 there. Um, and pro- I mean, but also like the whole, whole timeline's a little weird. I mean, we'll get into that later, but... Yeah. Well, any any X-Men project I that know. includes the first, the you know, any shot of the original five gets an immediate plus ten points from the Hard. so I think yeah. they, were, they were really married to doing that, but then they were like, oh, but our X-Men's young, like the first I know, and this, despite being relatively young and having, and not even really being a diehard of the comics, I, I always appreciate that, and I think that's cool. Yeah. Uh, and I think actually the bigger, I mean, because in the end, I spend such a minor character, it doesn't really matter. I need someone to explain to me Wolverine's timeline of where he needs to be introduced to Cyclops and Gene. And then how long does it take him to piss off Scott so much that Scott just loses his mind and Gene has fallen for him in some manner? Like, how long does that take? Yeah, the, the big the flash- Where he's developed a father-daughter relationship with Rogue. <laughs> yeah, the flashback episode really makes it seem like the argument that that starts the whole thing occurs not long after Wolverine arrives. So it, maybe it really is X Men Two. We're like, we've known you forty eight hours. What's your problem, dude? Yeah, um, and, um, yeah, that's tricky. Yeah, I just don't. And it's not. It's not that they couldn't explain it away. I just couldn't figure it out. I couldn't figure it out entirely. Yeah. Um, Rogue basically lifted from X Men Evolution and the X Men franchise and the film trilogy. 
Um, well, I, th- I think she's like a really good example of how they're mashing things up because you have this oh, yeah. uh, you have this younger version that's clearly come from the films and then was you know used in X Men Evolution, but she's not as frail as Anna Paquin. Like she is, she yeah. maintains a little bit of the sort of strong Southern badass from everyone's favorite nineties cartoon. And yeah, what I just meant by that was like um, in the X Men Evolution, Rogue starts off in the Brotherhood, and they kind of allude to that here a little bit with her kind of pre- either pretending or not pretending to join the Brotherhood. Yeah, she like um, she, she like pretends to join the brother. No, she pretends to join the X Men, is secretly with the Brotherhood, but then goes, "Oh wait, now nah, I'm bailing on this," and yeah. goes back to the X Men, but they don't want and, her there. And then as soon as she joins the X Men, they basically drop her as a character. Like I think yeah. there's even an episode two where she doesn't even have any lines, where she's like in the shot, in the background shots. Yeah. And then um, she comes back, and then they're like, "Oh, but we don't trust you." I was like, "But we just did this." <laughs> I know, but I'm saying, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like the last like eight episodes, I think it feels like she's in every episode, but does nothing. Yeah. Um, which is fine. You got to make choices. Um, Storm is in it, kind of similar. Once she's introduced, which is you know they did a whole sh- shitty shadow. Kick- story yeah it doesn't again. really do anything after that um which again i guess just confirms this is a follow-up to the x-men trilogy exactly this is the um, faithful this is the official third yeah, x-men this is, film. this is the brian singer edition. um cyclops is kind of like a recluse he doesn't give a fuck anymore he's got nothing to lose uh it's just blasting everything in sight <laughs> just destroys his television it's like dude that's yeah, your- <laughs> I, I kind of i kind of like it I yeah. like it. I, like I wrote it. I I wrote broken Scott Summers in both strengths and weaknesses of this show. Yeah. Um, I think I wouldn't. Ha- I wouldn't qualify it. I wouldn't like have a problem with it if it didn't lead to this over romanticizing of Wolverine. Mm. And um, like I like that he is so singularly focused on Gene, and like he recklessly goes after Sinister, trying to chase this lead and. I like that stuff, but then you also there is an element of it like okay, okay, come on, dude, snap, snap out of this a little yeah. bit, like step up. And so much leader. of it is just to make Wolverine like I told you so a million <laughs> times over and over and over again. It just gets dull to you. Yeah, like doesn't Wolverine even like he demands that he stop looking for Gene and and becomes a proper X Man again, and he's like okay. Yeah, um, and then finally we got Emma Frost who. Probably oh, has one of the best roles in the show. Yeah, she. I think she, second to none, has the best like arc of any character yeah. in the show. And um, you know, she's she's walking the line. You're you're not entire like she. You're not supposed to trust her, but she's so convincing for so long. You don't even you forget that you're not supposed to trust her, which is kind of perfect yes. from a storytelling perspective. And then it's finally revealed we should not have in fact been trusting her all along. And then she doubles back on that. Yeah. And she basically sacrificed herself to save Jean, and it's pretty awesome and touching. Yeah, and she loves Cyclops, think, and like, yeah, yeah. I, it's one of the blessings in the skies that we never got a second season because you know they would have brought her back somehow. Yes, um, but now we can pretend she actually died, and it's this beautiful, tragic moment at the end of the series season, our series, I guess, too. Yeah, that's what that's what um, Magneto was yelling about in in first and uh, Days of Future Past. He's like, you know, Emma's dead. It's like, wait, but that's in the cartoon. That hasn't happened yet. Oh, exactly. Yeah. Um, time travel. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I thought she was awesome. I think she's probably the best voiced character in it. I, I like the the mystery of it. I like her. Like, you know, initially you're like, well, don't trust her. Like, she's sort of mocking them a little bit and. She, I mean, it ends up being an earnest romance with Cyclops, but at first she's almost sort of like mockingly flirting with him, and then you know you bring it back around to, oh no, wait, you shouldn't have trusted her, and yeah, I, I think she goes on a real journey, and she's a fun sort of element to throw into the into the toy box of of known characters. Yeah, I think if anyone who was not familiar with Emma Frost saw that or read Weekend's X Men, um, or even the one before that, which I'm not a big fan of. Uh, that run before that, um, I think you just you would see that and just be like, "What the fuck did they do to Emma Frost in the movies?" Yeah, I know. Like, I think she is one of the characters that I'm I'm most sad about not getting a, a good a good shake. You know, like, yeah, I like I, I like that about this that the you know they're playing with these well known established characters, but then they are also giving 
more prominence to ones that sort of came into more vogue in sort of the early to mid 2000s you know your emma frost your uh you know like psylocke is in it for a little bit and uh spiral is here like you know they're, they're pulling some like more niche people and and sort of giving them more, more of a run like there's a ton of cameos from the the sort of new generation of kids that came in the mid 2000s like dust and pixie and so many people like i can sit here and just reel off names of characters i won't but i, I like that they did pull from so many areas of the x-men universe and they even like bring in like marvel characters like N- nick fury is in this show hulk is in this show nitro is in this show it's fun yes um it feels like what an x-men cartoon should be um so meanwhile while this is going on magneto's on genosha it's masquerading as a place for mutants to hide but meanwhile he's kind of secretly in cahoots with is he in cahoots with kelly no um who's he in cahoots he's, he's in cahoots with somebody quicksilver yeah Okay, anyway, so Magneto, you know, he's sitting on the sidelines patiently waiting for his time to strike. He's convinced the war is coming. He's preparing for the war. Magneto, standard Magneto arc. He flips sides a million times, um, including like five times probably in the finale. Um, It's Magneto. It's all the fun of Magneto. You get a lot of drama and daddy issues with his kids. Yeah. Uh, I love his kids. I will uh, say, I, I when Quicksilver says him at the end, I was like, "Oh, <laughs> yeah." I love I love um, the Magneto family. Uh, I yeah. love Quicksilver. I love Scarlet Witch. I love uh, Polaris. Like, I think they yeah. all have a really good dynamic with him, and everyone is different. And um, and then there's a big moment in the future with Polaris where she basically saves Xavier and everyone uh, who's fighting Master Mole at the end, and. That feels great. Wanda's awesome. Wanda's just an awesome character. Yeah. Um, and I, just, I like Quicksilver's like a good level of dickishness and like yeah. I like him like guessing a password by just typing hundreds of combinations a second and stuff. Like, yeah, I like that. You know, uh, he's he's looking for Magneto's approval, but yes. then he's also off on his own. But it all does boil down to that, and like you can see the hurt on him when it's like, oh, I can only trust Wanda. And he's just like, what about me? <laughs> and then, like, the sadness at the end where, like, Magneto's clearly just, like, using him. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. That was yep. good stuff. And Quicksilver is leading the Brotherhood, yes. which is the X-Men evolution interpretation with Avalanche, Blob, and Toad, and also Domino's kicking around. Mm-hmm. Um, Avalanche is not a weird 80s bully like he is in high school bully, like he is in evolution, and he's back to his usual... Um, some sort of European accent self. Well, he's meant to be Greek. I don't know what oh, really? the accent was here, but um, something European. Yes. Toad? Yes. Does Toad have dreadlocks in this? He does. <laughs> That's really shitty, but... Toad has uh, gone through more like, visual changes is... than any other character in yeah. all of X-Men. I mean, like, I was watching it, and I'm just like, yo, like, this feels like I'm watching Gone with the Wind, and it's like this slave coon <laughs> stereotype why does this shit keep happening in my x-men movies like this is all about not i, I just can't take it i don't understand um <laughs> sorry i wasn't expecting that um uh, yeah I, it's just so dumb and so needless and i don't understand why it keeps happening um <laughs> which and uh you know while i think we can both probably agree we'd like our X-Men characters more on the fun side. Let's let's do more Ray Park Toad. We need we need like fifty years of Ray Park Toad before I'm willing to see another ridiculous caricature play Toad again. Yeah. Um, especially since like they proved in that one, like Toad should be a badass. His powers are kind of great for combat fighting, visually and practically. Um let's not make him a joke anymore, especially one that is so obviously racist. Um, <laughs> well, he can be, like, a joke, but also dangerous. Like, that yeah, I think that, that yeah, was the right part. Something. Like, he's always just comic relief, otherwise. Anything. This was the worst. This I, I'd say this was the most... This was the only thing in the show that I think could be classified as offensive. <laughs> and uh, it's the worst betrayal of Toad by far. I mean, it's yeah. close. Um, 
in the future, Charles Xavier's walking around with like he has to walk. Got it. He's got yeah. Uh, he's got braces. We don't see him with hair at any point, but he does walk. Um, he must walk on everything. That is the rule. Um, <laughs> he's walking around in metal braces. He eventually stumbles on Bishop's um, crew of people, which includes Domino and Marrow. Mm. Uh, they take over a Sentinel robot in, in the most emotional episode of the show by far for oh, me. Because God. It's, it's brutal. The robot sacrifices itself to save everybody, and it's awesome. We can't talk and about that. They probably thing. can make a whole movie about that if they actually wanted to. Destroy. Uh, um. <laughs> Destroy! <laughs> it's never uh, not fun when a character can only say one word. Uh, they uh, they lift something from X2. Master Mold is going to use Xavier and Cerebro to kill and find all the mutants. Wolverine shows up and saves the day which, with a bunch of X-23 clones. Yay! Yada, 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 yada. That happens like right before they actually save the day in the past, when, which, once again, Wolverine saves the day. Um, uh, Emma saves the day. Uh, but if Wolverine does not trust Emma, he uh, I guess he cuts her free as well. Yeah. Um, Damn it. Wolverine must save the day. Um, other than that, uh, you know, Sandra Kelly's in there doing stuff with a, yet another version of Oliver Trask. We cannot all agree on what Oliver Trask looks like. Obviously, there must be fifty different versions of what he looks like. Um, they also lift the X, uh, astonishing X Men plot of the Cure. Which it was was it a fraud here? I can't remember. I can't. Was it an actual cure? I uh, don't. I don't think it was. No. Yeah, I think it was an actual cure, and they just canceled it or whatever. Um, yeah. I really, I meant to point out. I really liked that part of the X Men animated series where the cure was just a fraud. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that was. Very, I think that's a far better version of it than it actually being a cure. Just luring that's people in to become weird yeah. space horsey riders. Yeah, um, they go into Weapon X a little bit. They actually manage to resist using William Stryker, which is kind of shocking. They do. Um, Sabretooth makes a couple of cameos. It's revealed Mystique and Wolverine where used to be in love before his memory is erased. Maverick is there. Um, Will I Am is there. Everyone's there. <laughs> um, uh, I I love the mythology of Weapon X. I think this is one of the least interesting versions I've actually seen of it, though. Mm. Uh, it's like a uh, really interesting story that is frequently told badly. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't think there's been a better version than the actual novel, not graphic novel, uh, Codename Wolverine, which you all should check out. It's like 300 pages of Wolverine checking out his past. It's awesome. Um, Mike wrote it. Uh, um, let's see. Um, Gambit Mr. pops Sinister? up a couple times. Okay, what? Gambit. Yeah, sure. He pops up a couple times. He's an asshole. Literally every moment he's on screen, like, yeah. I punch him in the face. But that's premium Gambit. Like my uh, yeah, my childhood playing. memories of Gambit are like so clouded. I was like, oh, he's just so cool. And then you look at him as an yeah. adult, and you're like, this dude is just a sleazy dick. And like they really lent yeah. into that. Like in an evolution. He works Magneto, and here it's like, no, you're just literally just the worst, aren't you? Betraying mutants, like poor, poor Polaris, like tricked into loving him, and then he just leaves her. Yeah, um, it's great though. It's great, premium Gambit. Yeah, I think two. I think he's only in two episodes. If he was in any more, I think uh, I would, like punch my computer. I think he's in three. Okay, so I think he made some cameo at the end of one, right? Well, there's the one where he steals the collar. There's the one where he goes to Genosha, Genosha, and I swear there's one in between. But... I think he makes a cameo another one where, like, right before the first time he appears, he cameos at the end of one. Um, yeah. Anyway, I there's really no path of redemption in this version of Gambit, though. No. Like, you said, you were just too much of an asshole. Um, well, like he, I think they went for it with him being like when he leaves Polaris, he is a bit like. You know, he he's like acknowledging himself as an ass, and like he seems a little bit sorry that he's done this, but he's still gonna do it. <laughs> yeah. Um. Let's see. Uh, as you said, uh, Mister Sinister is there. Um. He's there, just not enough to not annoy me. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, like even even in cartoons, he is a little bit too weird to even exist. He's this crazy like Victorian scientist, vampire, zombie, geneticist, yeah. weirdo man. Um, and like he looks really, he always looks really cool. And yeah, he's like, like the he's like a drawing of every child's nightmare. But like, yeah, and that always that tricked me for a really long time into being thinking he was cool. Mm. And then in like the last two years, when I've actually went back and watched some of his stuff and read about who, what he does, his motivation, I'm just like this is yeah. everything I hate about X Men. You he, should read. <laughs> uh, there's a run of uncanny, uncanny X-Men. It's only like 20 issues that happened just before Avengers versus X-Men, uh, where he, that, book, that omnibus is awful, by the way, <laughs> Avengers versus X-Men is awful. It is. Uh, but the stuff with Mr. Sinister that happens, uh, I think actually at the same time as Avengers versus X-Men, but it's oh, incre- I'm Tony Stark. I'm going to release these little nanites that are going to prevent Magneto from using his power. Right yeah, right. I know, I know, I know, but, uh, the stuff of Sinister is incredible, uh, and everyone should should read that immediately. Like, literally, stop this podcast, go read it. I'll wait for two hours, or don't. No, we'll just continue. We'll just continue. Yeah, okay. um, yeah. Uh, in terms of other major characters, Apocalypse pops up at the end. They do the traditional storyline of. Okay, they saved the world in Days of Future Past, but that just creates another timeline, and now Apocalypse is taking over the world in this timeline. I think that's like an appropriate end one two punch end game for any story of X Men you're telling. Like like if you're gonna do like a five season version of the show, I say you do Days of Future Past season four, Apocalypse season five. Yeah. Um like you can't Apocalypse is probably as big as you can go without going to space and sp- space and X Men is just a bad idea. Yeah. I mean, the, uh, the two biggest stakes in the X Men universe are Apocalypse and Phoenix, and they did Phoenix, so yeah, and uh, they managed to keep Phoenix away from space, which was nice. I actually, I, we haven't even talked about that one. We'll I, I bet that was coming though. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh yeah. I mean, as soon as Jean magically disappears in the first episode, you know where it's going. <laughs> um, yeah, I think a part of me is actually kind of thinking it's the perfect way to end this show in the sense that. Apocalypse is just so limited in nuance that, it, although maybe it would work well for a long TV show like this, but I don't know. It's a very tricky thing to do if you don't put some people on his side that you want to root for. And um, that's very hard to do when the person's goal is take over the world. Yeah. Well, they had Sinister the... Um, they... I mean, they had the reveal being that... Well, it's not really a reveal. It's almost sort of a throwaway. Like, he talks to Apocalypse on a TV screen and is like, we got the samples. And I think he's referring to both Cyclops and Jean Grey. And then in the end of the show, we see Apocalypse, Sinister, and what looks like a like evil, bearded version of Cyclops. And like without going into it and putting Mike into a coma... Uh, there is this interesting dynamic with uh, Sinister wanting to sort of get out from under Apocalypse and betray him, and I think if they had had the chance to do that, that might have made things a bit more interesting. Like, you know, when we see inside of Apocalypse's camp, we also see Sinister doing an Emma Frost where he's, like, you know, trying to play every angle. So that might have been fun. But I knows? think an interesting idea would have been to do... Um, kind of like an emperor thing, or where Sinister is like Vader, and mm-hmm. Senator Kelly is like Tarkin, <laughs> and because like you know with Apocalypse, it's not about mutants versus humans; it's about the powerful versus the weak. So you could kind of like pour shoes and humans into it, and like if you had this really powerful human who's angling to take over the world, like maybe he'd be into that. Maybe, maybe that's a stretch, but um, I think. That maybe could be better with Sinister having his own intentions and not just being a mindless tool for Apocalypse, but even still, it's a tough thing to pull off. Uh, but uh, it was kind of a really cool way to end it. Maybe long to see what would happen. Yeah, and we will never know because they can- they cancelled it. But uh, they were allegedly going to you know do Apocalypse. They were going to bring in Deadpool, uh, Cable, Jubilee, Magic. Uh, Colossus 
But you know, we'll never know. Colossus what... pops up in the, uh, I think, literally the first scene, and then we never see him again. Yeah, I, I think. Does he talk? Does he talk? I don't know. I, th- I think uh, so. I think I've read a credit for someone as as Colossus on there, but I could be wrong. But yeah, they were I, get, they were going to like Colossus, reintroduce I, him or something. I think Colossus is probably one of the most interesting like male comic book characters in, mm. in like this conflict of. Physically, he's like the height of masculinity, and then emotionally, he's like not. <laughs> yes. um, with like, or at least what you're would be considered masculinity. So I always, I've always found that interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then his little sister is like a hell witch. So you know, that's fun. Yeah, I haven't. Thankfully, I haven't gotten that deep into comics to know that. <sighs> She's so uh, fun. Um. What else? I guess uh, they do the Phoenix thing. They, uh, I think this is probably the best adaptation of the Phoenix that I've seen. Uh, and I do, so it's. Do you, really do you think, it, do you think it's it. too rushed? It is, but I was so happy that <laughs> it was over. Like, like I um, mean, obviously we only got one series of this, so I wouldn't want them to put anything off. Like, I wouldn't want to take anything out of this. Yeah, but. You almost wonder if it would have been better to end the series with the big revelation of Emma was in on it the whole time, the Phoenix exists, whatever, and then deal yeah. with that in series two, and then end series two with Apocalypse, maybe? I don't know, but it did kind yeah. of feel... Actually, well, think about it, actually, that brings up a good point where in season two, then you kind of have Apocalypse and the Phoenix as like these two warring powers. And then you can kind of create a scenario where they have to, you know, Jean has to kill herself to save the world or something like that. Mm. And like nothing is stronger than the Phoenix. So how's Apocalypse yeah. going to react to that? Um, um, so that would, that'd actually probably be better. Yeah. Um, and I, then the, in the great moment with Emma dying though. So yeah. I honestly like the, the rain of diamonds falling down was <laughs> probably the coolest visual in the show. Yeah. It was pretty cool. Um, yeah, I don't know. Like it coming kind of out of nowhere is both an effective twist um, and also, you know, the the because they they build from the very first episode. Like this explosion, it came from Xavier, and Xavier was having this big telepathic headache just before it happened. And then it's like you get that reveal of, oh wait, uh, in the big Cyclops flashback episode, uh, he realizes it was Jean and it was the Phoenix and all this. So it's 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 a good twist because you're like, oh whoa. But then also it does kind of feel like, oh, by the way, Phoenix stuff is happening now. So I both like and don't like it. I think I more like it than I don't like it. Yeah. Um, I, I think I think the Phoenix just needs to be much more of a metaphor than an actual thing. <laughs> like something like where Jean just like can't die and the, and the power inside of her is too big. Like it doesn't need to be an actual like life force. Mm. I, I, I just, I think it's just, I, I think them treating it as something that was like, would pass on to any telepath and not just Gene was kind of stupid. Mm. Um, and I also thought like the flashbacks with Magneto, like recruiting her was a little, I don't know. It seemed a little much. I really but, like, but, um, before we get off this topic, um, when the Stepford Cuckoos are trying to, get Jean to sort of because there's a big element of she's put these mental blocks in place or Xavier did or she's, can, she's consented to them yeah yeah um, and she's like hiding the phoenix and the way they deal with that it really reminded me of uh, Jason Stryker as the little girl in X2 trying to get um, yeah. Xavier to you know do everything wherein it's a they've created a scenario in her head that like logically feels like her and it leads to you know oh here's here's magneto and the evil people where is the phoenix we need it to save us and i'd, I'd like that as a nice little touch and yeah, like an no, homage was, to the film it was it was very cool um like I, said, I think it's probably the best adaptation i've seen i would have tweeted just to make it not a life force but given that they seemingly wrapped up the phoenix in like three episodes at the end <laughs> Kudos. Or, or did they? <laughs> yeah. Because, uh, well, like, alright, so Emma, like, contains it within herself while she's a diamond, but then it breaks out, and then it just sort of, it seems to fly upwards, and then it's just gone? Yeah, I mean, I think the whole idea was that, the, f- the whole thing with the Phoenix Force was that it had to keep traveling, like, into yeah. something. So 
that in itself caused it to not like to just not lo- no longer have anything to travel into for some mm. reason. No. I don't know. It was cool though. It was a very cool yeah. sacrifice moment. Um, and sort of making good on the whole Emma's entire arc and sort of, you know, her accepting that Cyclops loves Jean, but he kind of does seem to also feel something for Emma and like, you know, he will save the woman that the man she loves, loves. I, I'm, I'm lost in my own words now. Uh, yeah, it, it was a really good, really good moment. Really good ending there. Um, let's see. Do you have a, a favorite episode? Um, God, uh, I I don't know if I do. I, I there are several that just stick out in my mind. One that always comes to me when I think of this show. It's not even necessarily one of my favorites if I like sit down and break it down. But uh, Nightcrawler on the ship to Genosha, sort of banding together with the kids and trying to stave off this attack from Spiral and whatnot, and like him teleporting. Uh, the attackers over the water and then dropping them in the in the same way you see in uh, in first class with Azazel dropping people out of the air. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, it's it's not great. It's just really memorable to me. Um, I don't know. I, I, there's a there's a lot. There's I there are some I really don't like as we've said, but uh, I I struggle to pin down a favorite. What about you? Um, I don't know. I'd say. Um... Well, that's the thing. I think, I think because it's so thing, serious. I think the rover thing will stick with me the most. Yes, yeah, that's really powerful. <laughs> um, um, I like. I do like Gambit, sort of like sleezing his way into into Lorna's life and stuff, and yeah. the that little... was just gross. I couldn't really. Yeah, no, no, it, it is. But this tra- you know, the tragedy of of Polaris. The like I said, I like the Magneto family. I like. Um, how like Wanda is the favorite kind of, or like the one that's most sort of respected, but then Lorna's his little girl, and you get this this moment of like when they're asking Gambit which which of the two daughters he uh, he went after, and then when they hear it was it was Lorna, it was like oh okay, good luck, um, and just sort of the I don't know, I like I like the interplay between the the Magneto family. Um, um I think the. I mean, I, I guess, uh, I don't know if we're kind of wrapping it up here, but uh, the best thing I could say about this is I'm really looking forward to it being back on Netflix one day so I can just kind of use it as background noise. It's kind of like one of the highest compliments I can pay a show. Yeah. Um, it's not on Netflix right now, which is annoying, but no. I, I assume like because there's an established relationship, usually they, you know, things come back eventually. Yeah. So I hope it does. Um, and, uh, I don't know. I hope there is another X Men cartoon show one day. Yeah, like that's that's the biggest thing I take away from this. Of like, like when I, when I think of this show, it's something that I just uh, you know I, I've said before. I work I work in the oh, I did work in a shop that sells DVDs and whatnot, and I had never heard of this show. And I just saw it on the shelf one day. I was like, oh okay, I'll, I'll just get this. I was like, this is amazing. Why aren't people talking about this? And I gather it is to to most people that it was a more widely known thing. Um, I I try and be like, oh, this is this hidden gem that not enough people have seen. But then everyone is like, oh no, I've seen that. It was really good. I was like, oh okay. Um, and just sort of what might have been for a series two, and just also missing out on having a an X Men cartoon. Like it feels like it's been a long time since since we had one. Um, then you know, given how oh, revered. Yeah. Yeah, given how revered that 90s one is and, you know, some people have a real sort of affectionate place in their heart for evolution and obviously people like me adore this one. It's like, uh, why can't we have something now? And, you know, like they say the reason that they killed the show off was because of money and like, I don't know, because they went on to immediately do an Avengers cartoon and then another one. And I mean, it was announced it wasn't coming back in 2010 and I just wonder, like, did they kill this in service of the Marvel Cinematic Universe and, like, wanting to sabotage X-Men? Like, is money just an excuse? I, I don't know, but I just can't help but wonder if, in a world where there's no politics between film studios and companies, would this show have continued or would we have a cartoon 
similar to this or inspired by this or from the same creative team or something and, and it, that makes me sad yeah. um, give us more X-Men uh, give us more X-Men damn it unfortunately <laughs> listeners we can't give you more X-Men um, we've covered everything and we're not going to go through every single episode of every cartoon ever so suck it um, I may I may be able to I may co- compose a like, a hodgepodge of things to discuss, though, uh, for one more X Men episode down the line before more movies come out. I have, I have a lot. There's a lot of things kicking around that we did not discuss. Yeah, this is true. There, there's always weird, wonderful things. Like there's, uh, there's the uh, the anime, the the Japanese anime of X Men. Uh, the, uh, the motion comic of Astonishing X Men. Yeah, I I saw that before I read it. Um. Yeah, I think like there, you you know. Yeah. One day. One, one day. But what happens between now and that one day, I hear all eight of you ask. That's right, I'm upping the numbers of people listening to this by a couple every time. Um, so we have this, you know, this start is just, hey, Matt, do you want to do this X-Men podcast? And I was like, yeah, sure. But then quickly it was like, what do we do when we're out of episodes? Because it kind of seems a shame that, you know eventually this will just go away because iTunes delete anything where there's not a new episode after a while. And, oh, uh, really? That's... Yeah, they do. Um, this will live forever on uh, on the real world and SoundCloud, but iTunes will delete it if we don't post new episodes. But there's no more X-Men to discuss. So what came to us while doing this was um, maybe we should spin this off, maybe we should do more stuff. And uh, Mike has the real world, his wonderful website, talking about films generally. I have a shitty review blog that I don't contribute to enough. And we're basically going to try and extend our filmic projects further and turn this into a more general film podcast. Uh, the real a, world podcast. An anthology podcast. Yes. Uh, a a catch all. A series of miniseries. Yeah. So we're going to maybe do like mm-hmm. a catch all, the real world podcast, where we'll just talk about whatever big film is out. But we also do like this idea of miniseries. Like, we've we've just completed our first one, the X-Men. And when trying to think of what our next big project would be, uh, we did get a lot of requests to talk about Marvel. But I think <laughs> that would not be a pleasant discussion for the two of us, as we are quite far apart on our opinions there. Uh, but what we do agree on generally, and another thing we bond about, is Batman. And uh, just as we had this weird bond about x-men and uh our mutual hey james marsden got screwed uh we both have the exact same memory of batman forever in that we were obsessed with it as kids and then it turns out shock horror it's awful awful. (laughs) so we thought it'd be fun to take on batman um so you've heard it here first we're gonna take a little break before we get into this of maybe a few weeks maybe a month and a bit i don't know uh but we are gonna take a little break do some rebranding and whatnot, but uh, just so that you're all prepared for next time, uh, we're going to get into Batman, and I think we are going to attempt to start early Batman, like 60s Batman, <laughs> Adam West Batman. Uh, then... In anticipation of the uh, cartoon movie that's coming out. Yeah, that uh, looks really fun, actually. Um, uh, uh, I'm hoping to see it in theaters. Yeah, yeah you're lucky it's coming out there, though. Um, so obviously there's a lot more Batman than there is X-Men, like so many cartoon movies, and that's before you even get into the films and before you get into, you know, the, there's multiple TV, uh, cartoon TV shows, um, as well, you know, everyone reveres Batman, the animated series, uh, as like the cartoon of all cartoons. So I don't think we can avoid delving into that a little bit, but we're not going to sit here and say, we're going to go into all of Batman in the same way we've attempted to go into almost all of X-Men. But we are going to give you the major stuff. Uh, we're going to look at the Schumacher films, the Burton stuff, uh, the Nolan trilogy. As I said, we can't help but avoid Batman the Animated Series. And we will see how we go from there. But that is the tentative plan. So stay tuned, I guess. Uh, go to the real world, uh, into the real world.com. Uh, I will probably update our Facebook page to have a different name uh, over the next few weeks. Uh, it will continue to live on SoundCloud, uh, which I think is just soundcloud.com slash Mike and Matt. So that's that works quite well. Nothing needs to change there. But uh, And you can also keep posted on our Twitter feeds. I am Matt C. Waters. Mike is... MC Thomas 216. That's right. 
That is his Twitter. Um, so just keep your eyes peeled. And, you know, maybe there's people that have been seeing all these go up and going, oh, these guys and X-Men, give it a break. But maybe they're going to see Batman and be like, whoa, Batman, I'll listen to some Batman talk. Or maybe not. So we'll see how that goes. But for now, it's been a pleasure talking about the X-Men for several weeks. Uh, and, you know, eventually there will be more X-Men films and we can revisit our excellent adventures, the greatest pun that we have come up with so far of one so yeah uh thank you everybody thank you mike for suggesting this and thank you me because i'm a delight and i guess you could say matt uh we started the fire yes the fire rises